Okay, thank you very much, uh, dear colleague. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to present here a tale of two viruses, HIV and Ebola. I do not have any conflict of interest to report. Um, however, I would like to thank the RCUG for allowing me a six weeks leave and the Swiss Cooperation and Development for funding us. And of course, Médecins Sans Frontières who built and organized the ETC in Freetown where uh, we were going. Although not frequently addressed in the media or in uh, public conferences, the topic HIV and Ebola has been relatively popular in peer-reviewed journal, as you can see here on this PubMed screen. Um, screen. Indeed, uh, the mobilization of HIV-related actors in the fight against Ebola disease has been substantial both in affected countries and outside. Many HIV researchers and clinicians have volunteered to work in the treatment centers or in clinical trial sites. Prominent HIV researchers have also presented on the Ebola response in several HIV conferences. And indeed, the results of the first trial assessing the efficacy of the favipiravir were presented during the 2015 edition of the annual conference on retroviruses and opportunistic infections conference, whose main objective is to share the latest studies on HIV AIDS and related infectious diseases. So why is that so? Is that only a question of numbers? Probably not. UNAIDS report an HIV prevalence in Sierra Leone of about 1.5%, 1.7% in Guinea, and 1.1% in Liberia. It is estimated that around 200,000 people live with HIV in the three most affected countries, and among them, 50,000 are on antiretroviral treatment, RRT. There was, and there still is, um, a particular concern related to the continuum of HIV care in crisis situation. People were reluctant to seek treatment in health facilities due to Ebola and also due to the mistrust in health system. And these graphs show the results of the periodic supervision visits to HIV public facilities in Conakry. And as you can see here on this graph, from April to December, the proportion of defaulter, meaning the proportion of patients not going to their routine HIV visits during at least 90 days, were increasing uh, from zero to 42% during the peak of the Ebola epidemic. And the risk of default, unsurprisingly, was highest between June and December, while the Ebola epidemic was increasing exponentially. It is critical to keep a minimum HIV service package also in crisis situation. UNH do recommend uh, in a statement from September 2014 that at least access to male and female condoms be kept, safe blood transfusion services, PMTCT service continuations, TB HIV service continuations, post-exposure prophylaxis for non-occupational or occupational exposure to HIV, and, of course, antiretroviral therapy continuation for people on treatment. As you can see, the initiation of new patients or the diagnosis of new patients for HIV is not considered by UNH as, a, uh, as a critical in such situations. So clearly, the Ebola outbreak has resonated strongly with HIV actors due to numerous similarities and lessons that can potentially be drawn from HIV to support the Ebola response. Let's spot some key similarities and differences among these two diseases. Apart of being from a zoonotic origin, both, both viruses have a huge societal impact and stigmatization while Ebola do require short-term emergency care, HIV is a chronic disease. We do have uh, efficient antiretrovirals for um, HIV, although we have no vaccine and no cure. Surveillance is critical in both diseases, and healthcare workers are key component of the uh, epidemic response in both diseases as well. 
Indeed, the prevention alphabet of Ebola, avoid body contact, ABC, as you can see on these uh, photographs, is exactly identical to the very famous one that we use for years in the HIV prevention, which is a bit different anyway, but ABC in HIV language means abstinence, be faithful, and use condom. Some caricaturists from the Tribune de Genève uh, enjoyed also this no-touch policy, and you can see here it's written in French, je préférais le sida, I would have preferred to have AIDS. So stigma and discrimination are probably the best example of unwanted similarities. Greg Gonsalves, a New Yorker activist, said uh, recently in the New England Journal of Medicine, I quote, History is repeating itself as an irrational, punitive measures deployed in the AIDS epidemic 30 years ago are revived for another disease, this time a rare hemorrhagic fever responsible for only a few local cases. He was, of course, talking about what did happen in the US last autumn. This picture is from a brochure edited by the very serious Swiss National Fund. It shows, and I think better than any words, the fear, and in this case, the fear of a traveler coming back from one of these three most affected countries. But as a reminder, I would like to say that travel restrictions are still existing for people living with AIDS around the world. Even if in this map you can see that the US do not, are, not long, are no longer using restrictions, it was the case up until 2012. So there are several lessons from the HIV epidemic that can be applied to the Ebola outbreak. Stressing, for example, the importance of interventions to reduce stigma. Stressing the importance of widespread screening of individuals exposed to Ebola virus. And hopefully, the point of care testing, even if Laurent didn't mention them, I hope one day they will be coming. Engaging affected communities using innovative approaches to the dearest shortage of healthcare workers, investing in data for decision making and treatment access. So how can we achieve these goals? MSF has developed a community-based approach in South Africa as a strategy for achieving viral suppression. The photo here shows an RT adherence club meeting in a club member's home. And these clubs are thought to encourage acceptability and openness about HIV in the community. I found a very similar spirit in the MSF ETC in Freetown. Indeed, in this ETC, cured patients were asked to come back and help with the care of children. And you can see here uh, people who were cured survivors and taking care of children in, in the tent. And finally, I would like to stress the importance of gathering the evidence to improve the quality of care. In the Ebola field, case reports are published in the most famous peer-reviewed journal. We can see that uh, in, in this case reports from the New England last autumn. And indeed, the clinical information on Ebola disease is rare, is very rarely standardized across ETCs, and of course, it is extremely difficult to export this information due to the high risk zone and to its constraints. So you can see here the next speaker. MSF created standardized monitor monitoring form in the very early days of the antiretroviral access in resource limited settings. And this uh, monitoring form standardized enabled the, the creation of very large databases and cohort study. Thanks to this cohort study, we could show the ability of antiretrovirals to improve survivals also and even in the most severely affected patients. You can see here on this kaplan meyer curve, uh, patients with CD4 cell count below 15. So since then, uh, I think we can say that because of this cohort and the advocacy that used the data originating from this cohort, treatment access was a battle for HIV treatment since 2000. It is for Ebola um, at its uh, commencement. Uh, 
Also, this slide shows the GIKI trial that Laurent presented just before, showing the favipiravir cohort in Guinea, showing relatively disappointing results, but still uh, the first results that were ever presented in a cohort. Controversy about optimal study design exists. In the HIV field, only one RCT against placebo, so with no other comparator, took place in uh, July 1987, published in the New England by Margaret Fisher. And this is, as far as I know, the first and the last placebo-controlled randomized clinical trial for HIV. The controversy about the use of placebo, I think, is very, um, is very important to address, especially in the case of the Ebola disease, that really mimic the dilemma and the discussion that uh, happened at that time in the HIV field 30 years ago. So we can say that um, because of all of this trial, these cohorts, the gathering of data, we now have uh, antiretrovirals that are very efficient. Efficient to control the viral replication, efficient to um, have an immune reconstitution, efficient as a simple way with only one pill once daily, efficient to increase survival and to decrease transmission with the potential also to curve the epidemic. HIV was considered as a unique success of research, activism, and political commitment. I do hope that this statement is wrong. I do hope that HIV will not be the only, um, the, a unique success of research and political commitment. I hope that for the patient affected with Ebola, we will also have quickly efficient treatment, and I think that's the, one of the reasons why we all here um, together today. So I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you.